Okay, good afternoon, everybody. How many um, here this afternoon were in this morning's session? Okay, a bunch of you. Rest assured, this is not gonna be a duplicate session. Okay, we, did, we wanted to open with the, the same video. So welcome back. Uh, this afternoon, we're gonna talk um, a little bit more at the micro level, more anecdotal. Um, and so to help me get Reality Bites um, started, I've got the same cohorts from this morning, but I have Alex Castro, Melody Hayes, Sumi Smith, Paul Smith, and Bill Otterbeck. We've got a couple of helpers, Monique and Ralph, who are helping us with the logistics. And then their fantastic videographer back there, Hi, video lady. Thank you very much for all the good work you're doing. But welcome to Reality Bites. And uh, I guess if Reality Bites you, one of the things you could do is bite back. But that doesn't always work, right? So, well, you know, we thought we'd get this um, play on words and offer you this afternoon the, the reality of the situation as much as possible. I think if you heard the keynote during lunch, it was, again, more of a reality check. What really happens in the real world? What do I really have to do? And so he had mentioned an F word. What was the F word that we heard at the lunch keynote? Failure. Failure, right. So I have another F word for you. Besides fun, it's fear, okay? So this slide is a message to you about not losing your nerve when it comes to change. And easier said than done, right? Because again, there are a lot of things at play. If you're scolded every time you bring bad news and say something that has that other F word in there like failure, the chances of you running back up there and taking the message over and over again are pretty nil, right? Because number one, nobody likes to get beat up. Number two, you know, fear of failure in itself is just not a happy place to be. There's a lot of things that are going on inside um, you emotionally because you're smart enough to know what you should be doing and could be doing and are doing and even though you're doing all of that something goes wrong and you just you know you have the emotions kick in so we're only human which is what organization change management is all about you've got processes but you also have people so we want to encourage everybody that we're going to share some anecdotal ex you know stories with you today that will hopefully help you to not lose your nerve when it comes to organization change management. The Harvard Business Review put out a really great article uh, not too long ago called um, Accelerating Corporate Transformations, and the subtitle was Don't Lose Your Nerve. Now, it was corporate transformations, but the scale of the work that's done in the corporate arena is pretty much at the same scale that you guys are hitting, if not a little more difficult because of the regulations and all of the mandates that you work with in legislative and, and, and um, governance in general. So in that article, uh, it did describe some of the reasons why um, change happens slow. And the way to accelerate the change is to get over some of the brakes that are put on. So if brakes are occurring, what are some things that you could do to accelerate? Well, here's some of the breaks. Let's see if any of these sound familiar to you. So you have a cautious management culture. That's a speed break. That'll slow change down like nobody's business. You have a business as usual management process. Anybody familiar with, with that, right? How about um, initiative gridlock? Not that that ever happens in the government. Right? We never have gridlock. Everybody just flows and decisions are made very readily. Um, disengaged employees. If you're in this morning session, you heard us talk a little bit about that. How do we get people engaged? Then at lunch, once again, heard about how do you get people engaged? Um, how about a loss of focus during execution? Kind of the old, you know, we've been doing this for a while, but what the heck, why were we doing this and what were we trying to accomplish in the first place? So when those things occur, those really are those thing, the things that'll put the brake on anything that you're trying to get going. So if you're not gonna lose your nerve, one of the things you can do is something called the no slack launch. The no slack launch is also from the Harvard Business Review. And the intent of no slack launching is you do this while your normal stuff is going on. So this is not going to replace anything that's going on, but this is a way to get some of those speed brakes loosened up. You confront reality, <laughs> again, easier said than done, 
but we're going to hear today some ways to actually make that happen. We're going to focus your vision and the business model. Again, it's how to retain that focus, remembering why you're doing what you're doing and who you're doing it for. Uh, aligning to the transformation initiatives, things keep changing. So how do you know that you're still in alignment with where the organization is going? And then how do you know that your team is in alignment with those goals as well? And how do you do all of that when everything is moving? And then lastly, to engage everyone from top to bottom. In our morning session, we talked about the fact that change, organization change really affects everybody no matter what level, position, role you have in the organization. So anything that is going to be effective has to be every, everyone included. So it's definitely an everyone from the top down. Some of the process behind this is integrating change management into your project management activities. So if change is implemented via something called a project, and you guys are awesome project managers and you have a method to all the madness, you have a process and a procedure, there's actually a way to integrate organization change management activities so that it doesn't feel like it's an additional burden. So on this next slide, I want you to look at, hopefully you can see this. If you can't see this, sorry, I'll read this. But on the left-hand side, you have something that looks pretty familiar, right? Does that look familiar to you guys? Been there, done that, okay? Initiate the project, scope, plan, design, develop, deploy. On the right-hand side, we've put some of the OCM, or the Organization Change Management Activities, you can do while you're in these specific stages. So for instance, in initiating the project, you want to conduct readiness assessments and impact analysis about the change and how it's going to affect people. Um, scoping and planning, you want to identify and start building your uh, sponsor coalition. You want to select and prepare your change management team. So this is helping you to see where do you actually start doing these things. And then in planning, there's this thing called communicate why the change is being done. That, that is going to be a repetitive theme here. You heard it this morning, you're going to keep hearing more about it, and it's because it's so important. So here at the planning, you're going to communicate. In design, you're going to prepare and equip your managers and supervisors so they can get the job done. You're going to launch some group and coaching sessions. You're going to reinforce messages with your sponsors, which then again is more communicating. So you guys who are in the design and deployment, notice that you communicate, communicate, communicate. So again, it's everybody, all levels, anywhere in the organization, technical people, business people, everybody has a role in making sure that communication is happening. Then you get into deployment and there you go again, more communication. Okay, so hopefully <laughs> we're not sounding like such a broken record, but I don't know how many times we've said the word communicate and it's not because we don't think you get it, it's just that we want you to hear how important we believe it is. Critical sponsorship, uh, or the critical role of sponsorship, we wanted to showcase this to you as well. It's a common theme. ProSci, who does a, a, a phenomenal uh, research, comes up year after year when they survey people. Since 1998, the number one critical success factor was having an active sponsor. So there must be something to having your sponsor not only show up, but keep showing up. So one of the biggest mistakes is your sponsor walks away too soon. Maybe they showed up at the beginning and then they disappear. You know, that's a, that's a huge mistake that could happen. Um, how about not being active and visible throughout the project? Could anybody have virtual sponsors on paper, or on email? <laughs> I mean, they say they're with you but you never see the person. I mean, and everybody's busy, but that's what happens, right? So we have this invisible man or woman who is the one, this is what we want to change. We want to get that person visible and engaged throughout the project, which is a huge challenge. But we're gonna have some ideas and thoughts for you on how to do that. And I bet you guys have some great ideas too. And in doing so, I'm going to turn this over to Alex, who's going to run the next portion of the session. Uh, and before we do that, Alex, let me just tell you guys what's going to happen today. After we hear all of the phenomenal stories from our 
experts here in change, which Alex is going to moderate, we're going to have a group exercise where you're going to get to solve a problem. And we're going to give you some time to do that. We're going to facilitate and help you along if you need it, or we're just going to stay out of your way. And we're going to ask one of you at each table to record your solution and then to designate somebody to share. So Alex is going to go with, uh, through that with you later today, but I just wanted to <laughs> set the stage. So if any of you guys disappear, okay, we're going to remember <laughs> that you bailed, yeah, <laughs> that you bailed on us. Because so, we want to make this as much fun and, and interactive as possible. And then again, it's all about reality bites. So we want to hear the reality from you as well. So we're going to get to do that later on today. Aren't you excited? Okay, so for now, Alex. Thank you. All right, guys. So um, the next, uh, you know, I think Lorraine explained a little bit. You know, we're going to go through the panelists' perspectives on change and provide some insight for you, right? So what that'll help do is is really frame it out a little bit, give you some data points to kind of start churning those creative thought processes, and then we're going to turn into some of these scenarios. And we're going to throw that at you. You guys are going to do some collaboration, which is, I think, part of the whole outcome of this entire forum today, right, is to build those relationships amongst different state folks. Uh, and then be able to come up with some, you know, responses in terms of what the change uh, challenge is. Uh, and then get feedback, right? But really, the opportunity here, which I think is really wonderful, you know, being a vendor, right, is that uh, the feedback is in a non-critical, non-judgmental way, right? Because when you're in the project and you lob something out, you always have to be politically conscious about, all right, do I put this thing out here? You're in a place where really we're not, you know, we're not in that environment. We're in an environment where we have some seasoned executives up here who have gone through some really mind-numbing projects and dealt with those at multiple scales, multiple agencies and departments. And all they're trying to do is give you that insight, that feedback, you know, we're hearing your thinking and we're going to add our thought process to that so that it helps in evolving that without having to hesitate and think and, you know, be on your own and say, hey, is, is this, you know, should I even suggest this? So don't hesitate in that suggestion. Bring it to the table, look for that presentation, and then get that feedback, right? Because I think it's a unique opportunity to do that. So uh, in speaking today, uh, I think we're going to start with Paul, right? Paul's with CDCR, and uh, I think you're going to discuss um, the number one mistake that can derail uh, an effort and opportunity, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So the problem you always have when somebody says, give me the biggest problem, right? And especially when you're talking to a group full of people, or, you know, a room full of people. Um, is my biggest problem going to be your biggest problem? Okay, so all I'm going to convey here is the biggest problem in general that I have experienced, and I'm going to actually tell you a story of how I experienced it, and maybe you'll, you'll share some of the, the pain I felt. Years ago, uh, the Biz Project, which I'm now the director of, the program director of, went live in corrections. He was a large ERP, does supply chain and HR and all that kinds of stuff. Melody was there with me. And Melanie was there with me, and it was, it was frankly a train wreck. Okay, it was, uh, it, nothing worked, there was no business transition plan, communication was non-existent. Um, our, our transition plan when we were in procurement together was go, okay? We had no idea where the business, would where the work was gonna come from, where we were gonna send the work to, how to actually, we knew actually how to make the system work, how to key it in, but we didn't know any of the business processes around it. We didn't have anything built around it. And I was in the business at the time. So I made a huge amount of noise the project director at the time, a person named Andrea Roman, who became CIO of the state, I mean the state, uh, CIO of the year for the state, um, came to me and said, you know what, Paul, you can complain or you can come over here and do something about it. So I did. When I arrived, the project team was completely hunkered down. Do you guys know what hunkered down means? Hunkered down means the, shell, the shelling is so intense, the fire is so intense, that they had stopped communicating completely. They, had, they were sitting in a room, and I'll never forget, I came in as the change manager. And you know, I had to announce that I was the change manager to these people. I had to come in and say, I have been hired to be your change manager. They did not even know that. That's how bad communications were. So I come down with these people and I said, 
listen, we got to get out there. We got to get out in front of this thing. And they said, no, no, no. We've got to make sure the message is perfect. This was really, really bad. We can't make two mistakes in a row. We've got to make sure the message is perfect. So they sat there for about a week and they're just tailoring the message and tailoring the message. And I realized I had a big problem on my hands. These people were terrified. They were terrified. They would not stick their head above the wall for fear of being shot. Okay, they were terrified. You were there, right? That was a pretty painful time. And the funny thing is their first reaction was, don't make a mistake again. Don't make another mistake. So what they did was, nothing. And in that absence of any type of message or any type of communication, what happened? Anyone know? What? It got worse. Anyone else? Anything else happen? People started to make it up for us. They started telling stories about that the system doesn't work. It actually kind of worked. That, uh, that the, the training was not right, that uh, the, it not, wasn't sized correctly, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. And now all of a sudden we were playing whack-a-mole with rumor control, right? Because somebody would not stand up and say, this is what it is. So a gentleman came in and uh, he took over as the project director and I convinced him what we need to do is we need to get in front of everybody and have a meeting and have everybody talk to us. It wasn't talking. It was a lot of screaming. It was a lot of yelling. In fact, there was one gentleman who said there would be a tremendous career to be made here in executive coaching because there were so many people yelling at us at the time. I'll never forget driving back with that project director. We were driving our, our offices outside of downtown, so we had about a 35-minute ride, which was incredibly quiet. And he turns to me three quarters of the way over and he says, my God, they were screaming at us. They were screaming at us. And it was the most blown away tone you've ever heard in your life. And I turned to him and I said, yeah, but they're talking. Yeah, but they're talking. I was trying to find the bright side of this thing. But what we realized was we had to get out in front of it. So this guy and I got in a car every day and we drove to every place that the business was done, and we let everybody yell at us. If you've ever done customer service before, ever on the phone or dealing with somebody like that, what happens, what's the very first thing that happens? Somebody calls you up, they're mad. What do they do? You're nodding your head and you know what they do. That's right, and they scream, and they want to elevate over your head, and they're yelling and yelling and yelling and yelling. If you try to solve at any point during that yelling, what happens? It gets worse. It gets more intense. But what you do instead is you listen. You listen. And then all of a sudden you're going to hear this one thing and it's magical. And every time it happens. Ready? <sighs> I don't mean to yell at you, but. <laughs> right? And that's when you get to solve. So what I'm trying to say to you is, when you're in these types of situations, don't hunker down. Engage. Listen. Don't try to answer the question too soon. Listen, because you don't even know what the question is. You don't even know what the problem is. They haven't told you yet. Wait for the breath. <sighs> but have the courage to stand there and listen. Because we're project folks, right? We chose this on purpose. We're not program folks. We chose this on purpose. So when you're doing this from a communication standpoint, from a change management standpoint, have the courage to stand there and listen to your customer even in the worst times. And at that point, they're going to tell you what they really need to get done and get fixed. And they did. And we did. And biz works. It's actually won a national award. So what I'm trying to point out to you, the biggest mistake is don't hunker down. Do the exact opposite. I know you want to keep your head down. I know it's hard to get yelled at. But do the opposite. Stand up. Own it. Be honest. Listen. Wait for the real question or issue and then engage. And you'll find that your customer will be willing to engage with you because you had the courtesy to listen and you had the, the respect to stand there and take it. You will find that they will engage with you. So that's just my story. Any questions or any issues that somebody else may have something, their own personal one? Okay. Yeah, feel free to ask questions at this point. You know, it's okay. You need to break in. Anybody? Bueller? 
Okay. All right. Um, next, we're going to introduce Bill, and uh, he's going to talk about what to do when something goes wrong. All right. Well, we we never have problems on projects, right? Uh, so I've been with Department of Healthcare Services for about two years, and um, I joined Healthcare Services at the time we were cutting over from uh, a 30-year legacy vendor to a new vendor, right? So we had um, a very um, successful convert, what we called assumption of operations. Uh, it was an incredibly difficult transition, you know, 40,000 tasks over about a year to prepare for cut over and then cutting over to the new vendor. To October 2011, and it was all hands on deck, right? Uh, unfortunately, at the same time, we were supposed to be planning for uh, replacing the, the existing mainframe system over four years, right? And there was all sorts of foundational deliverables we were supposed to um, review, approve, and they would set the foundation for our project plans, software development approach, and a myriad of other uh, foundational deliverables. Well, we had been all hands hands on deck, right? We were cutting over from one vendor, you know, lift and shift from, you know, existing mainframe and getting our new vendor to to run operations for us. And what what occurred is we were behind in, in doing the these this set of foundational deliverables. Our vendor didn't hit the mark. We weren't satisfied with the quality of the deliverables. And uh, ultimately, we had to do a set of corrective action plans to say, our, we have a line in the st uh, sand. We're not going to start this um, system replacement project until you have deliverables that meet our requirements. And part of the reason I'm sharing this with you is we have a quarterly uh, reporting requirement to the legislature. And we uh, you know, had a discussion early on, you know, successful assumption operations, let's continue to tell that success story, right? But we had to have a, a real world discussion about how do we frame this in our um, in our communications to the legislature? And so, in our legislative briefings, we told a narrative about the challenges that we had on the project, the series of corrective plan, uh, action plans, and how we were managing those corrective action plans to a successful start of our um, system replacement project. And the the lesson or the message I want to share with you is when you are open and you have a level of transparency that builds credibility with your stakeholders and whether that be oversight agencies or the legislature or others having that openness is important but it is also important to remember that you just don't blurt out we're having problems right there is a way to frame the story that you intend to tell and your role in providing a solution and fixing it and being thoughtful about deliver, delivering that message and, and quite frankly developing that message is really important. Um, earlier in my career, um, I sat in a meeting with a project director and you know, it, was a, uh, it sounded like one of your meetings, Paul. It was a lot of yelling and you know, tumult. Uh, and the person said something about the, you know, the project's off the tracks, right? And I heard that very quote, you know, cited back by a staff person, right? The, the words we use in describing how we are responding to challenges are really powerful. And in leadership positions, it's, I, who's been quoted? <laughs> you know, you said something in a meeting and it, you got it quoted back to you. Uh, by a show of hands, who's gotten quoted back, right? The, the words we um, choose to use send an important message. And, you know, we're not talking about candy coating the challenge, but we are wrapping around the very real challenges any significant project has around what are the solutions that we're bringing to the table to resolve those challenges. And part of that is how are we managing our vendor? The second, you know, pearl of wisdom I would share with you is, you know, early in my career, um, we had a, a challenge with a particular um, set of forms and, and, and notices that were going out, and there's a whole bunch of duplicate notices going out, right? And, the, and courts were getting frustrated, and county agencies were getting frustrated. Well, the manager who was working on that was working very much in earnest to fix the problem, but didn't escalate the issue, right? And so I didn't find out for about 10 days and when a county director called me and the administrative office of the courts called me. And so I went and talked to the manager and I said, well, so what's going on? And he, and he said to me so earnestly, we've been working so hard to fix the problem, 
you know, I wanted to make sure it was fixed before we communicated it. And it was such a well-intentioned message, but it really was a coaching and learning moment, which is, in our business, we can't wait for the complete root cause analysis or for, the, for the, the challenge to be solved. We need to know early so that we can act early, get the right resources employed, and talk through what does this mean to our project and how do we communicate it not only internally to the project, but what is the message about our response that we want to deliver external to the project. Um, the other piece is in, in escalating issues, you know, as, um, as a senior um, project executive, you, you have the ability to get the right resources to the table. And, you know, what I try and, and tell folks is bad news doesn't get um, better with time, and I don't particularly like surprises, right? And, you know, if there is um, an atmosphere of trust and support within your organization, and that gets to your culture and in the environment that you're creating in your department or agency or, or in your division or branch, if there's a culture of support and open people are going to bring you issues early. And I think that's just such a critical piece of sort of managing the change, keeping in front of it, and making sure that, you know, sort of an incremental challenge doesn't become the crisis that undo undo undoes you, or un <laughs> un makes you undone. Um, and then the last thing I would share is, uh, we recently, um, at the Camus Project, California Medicaid Management Information um, System Project, went through an evaluation of our requirements development and, and um, had a real good discussion with the project team about what it meant to do our project. And one of the things that surfaced out of that is um, we needed to remind the team that we were doing a modified off-the-shelf development, not a from, the, you know, from the ground up development, right? And, you know, we've heard of other projects that have struggled with that, but it really took having another conversation with a team about this is what it means to have a MOTS development. This is what it means to have a business process centric development effort. Uh, and it really came out of you know, listening to the team, understanding there was some confusion at the team level, and helping the team understand what the real project approach was. And in response to that, you know, we, we saw some confusion at the team level. We convened a summit, brought the entire team together so that we could talk through what our software development approach was, what our change management approach was, so we could confirm that everyone had a similar understanding so that as they went back to their, um, their requirements and business analysis teams, they really had a shared understanding of how we were trying to manage this project. And, and you know, just my you know, words of wisdom to you is, if you're hearing confusion at the team level, you know, reach out through your you know, project managers or directly to find out, well, what is causing the swirl? And don't let it swirl too long. You know, have those discussions, and you may need to bring your team back together and say, I need to reaffirm, we need to re reaffirm, you know, what the priorities are, what the approach is. Don't assume that everyone understands your software development approach or the overall way that you intend to manage the project. Sometimes that get, gets lost when you get into those working sessions on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll pause and ask if there are questions or perspective. Anybody? No? Yes. yes. Yes, Judy. <laughs> I'm not going to ask that question, Bill. Oh, okay. <laughs> what I wanted to know was, in general, what was the response from your from your team leaders um, when you after that summit? What was the what was the outcome of that summit when you when you actually did more? Did you did you clear it up right away? Did it take time? Was it you know, did you have to do it again? What? Yeah, that's a, a great question. The purpose of the summit was to sit back down with the entire team and talk about um, the fact that we are managing to a set of deliverables and the primary one was the software development approach that laid out our system development life cycle for the project. Um, it, it had become shelfware for a number of the folks. We wanted to make sure that it was used on a regular basis so that people understood the framework for how we were doing it. Uh, what the summit did was it, it ensured that we were all 
speaking from the same playbook. Uh, and what we did at the end of the summit was we encouraged folks, if, you know, if they were confused or they needed direction, to engage their manager, engage their project teams. And that has happened over, what is it, the last eight weeks since we have had the summit. So that it's, it's encouraged a level of dialogue. And if something's swirling at the team level, the escalation out of the team is happening much more quickly. So from that vantage point, it's been really helpful. Thank you for the question. Others? All right, Alex. Awesome. Thanks so much, Paul. All right. Uh, next on the uh, batter's deck is Melody Hayes. And she's going to talk about what you would do differently the next time. Or any other time. No, I, so I was going to, I'm going to make this a little more just kind of learning lessons along the way and kind of what I've learned because some of you are maybe in different places in your careers as in project management some may be very experienced some not very experienced and um, what I like to think you do is learn from your mistakes and you need to hopefully and I've been very fortunate to have a culture of support in my career where people recognize the talent I had that maybe I wasn't necessarily as polished as I needed to be in certain aspects of running projects even though I knew how to run a project um, and I'm just going to give you a couple quick examples. And some of it is just related to having the buy-in from your customers in front of the department director at Corrections. And he tore up the SPR and threw it right back across the table at me because I asked a question about how involved our customer was. So this was some years back. But, you know, that was kind of a... Well, so they're a, and yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. So, so, yeah. So I took away, well, okay, well, I'm never going to be unprepared again and not know where my business site is with me when I go into a meeting around a project and project approval. So I've carried that with me forward for every project I've been on since then. I want them at the table, engaged, and understand. And you heard me in the last session talk a lot about that, having that sponsor buy-in. But these are just trials by fire that really taught me a lot. Um, when I was at... Uh, the employment development department. I was uh, an application development manager on a very large uh, business change project, which actually was very successful, but, but I uh, had some run-ins with the integration vendor, and they didn't really like how I was operating, and they complained to the project director, so I was moved off the project. So that, okay, well, there's some lessons to be learned there about how we, inter how we interact with our vendors, and you know, making sure that I have the support and clear direction from my leadership when I'm going in to try to negotiate uh, situations. So it's the same thing that you can take with your sponsors. You know, you just have to be real clear what the direction, and if you're not the one running the project, you need to be in sync with what the direction is of the administration, of the department, of the CIO, of the project director, and that you're consistent. So, you know, I learned I better be a little more connected and understand and understand this vision. Um, and then just the last example, um, I had a project in my current organization um, where the project sponsor, I didn't really, I learned a lot about political, people that are more political and are more worried about how it looks outward and how they're perceived versus really wanting to be a part of the detail of the work of the project. And we had had a large briefing about the schedule and the need to have the commitment and she's out talking to all the counties to make sure they're going to be committed to the schedule and work with us. And three months later, we had, but we had presented some uh, conditions of potential things that can impact our schedule. So we're monitoring, and this is good project management. I'm a good project manager. I'm going to monitor these issues, and if any of these things are realized, we, we told you that there could be an impact. So about four months later, we came back with an impact, and um, she's pretty much wigged out. And she, she thought I had really let her down and that she couldn't trust anything coming out of our organization. So I was removed from that project. So it was, it was tough, you know, but the good news for me was I learned from that. So each one of these times that that happened, luckily I had the support culture in my organization that recognized the talent I was bringing. So I was learning and I was demonstrating my learning. And so as I moved forward in my career here at OSI and I've moved, I was, I got an opportunity to take on another project. So the very first thing I did was went and met with a sponsor to make sure I understood what their priorities were, what the state of the project was, what their concerns were and that they were on board with the vision. Um, that we didn't have really good stakeholder engagement. We started an effort to do a little bit better reach outreach with the advocates. Um, it wasn't perfect because they still had some issues going live here in the last year, but it was better. So, you know, you have to kind of just bring those lessons learned forward and, you know, learn from the mistakes. But I, I can't express enough, engage your leadership, you know, acknowledge, you know, where you have 
concerns you where you need help and ask for the help but there's no shame in asking for help or admitting you don't know something or you can't resolve it you know and that you need help somebody in the organization you know now I'm usually the one that people are coming to but you know wherever you are in your career do not do not try to chug along by yourself and and try to flounder and flounder because what you want to do is be early warning and early communication with your sponsors to make sure they know what's happening and when you do that, we, I had another project, I see Christy here, we had, you know, uh, we had an insurance that it didn't come in on time, but we had very supportive sponsor engagement. And so we managed that relationship all along the way. So even though it was late, they were engaged, they understood the impact, and they were very much committed to the success of the project. So, you know, you just, you just can't overemphasize the need to have those kind of relationships with your with your sponsors and with your execs in your organization. And the higher you move, I, the other thing I'd say is, get to know who the people, all of the deputy directors or all of the program directors in your department who are in the program areas because you will eventually at some point be doing projects for them or interacting with them and they want to know who you are and you want to know who they are. So you build that trust relationship for any future uh, projects that you're gonna be doing with them. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I wonder, Melody, if you would share just a little more detail uh, and maybe focus to people who are earlier in their career, and it would probably it would apply to wherever you are on your career continuum. But getting to know people, yeah. getting to know those people, do you have some advice for people who are new to the agency or organization? How yeah. how do you do that? I mean, what are some ways that somebody could do that? Well, and it kind of depends on who you are and where you're at. But um, I will say that, uh, as I said in the last session, and what I just kind of was trying to demonstrate was that I was so focused on, I want to be a good project manager. I want to do this good, you know, that I didn't really focus on making sure I understood the business and I understood. So, you know, I, you know, whatever level you are in the organization, there's nobody in your organization that would mind you not setting up an appointment with them to come talk about, well, what is it you do in, in child welfare? You know, that's what I did when I first went there at, at OSI. Went on a ride along with a child welfare worker. I went and talked to the, the program people who were my uh, counterparts in the organization just to understand what we did. You know, went out and visited counties. You know, so just make it your business to get to know the business of the organization that you're working for. At corrections, I did the same thing. I was on four different projects at corrections. We were out at the prisons meeting with all of the, the different staff and understanding what their needs are. You know, and so. I can't. Exp I think that's the real key to success is is partnering with your business and understanding the business. And that's like I said before. But go to meetings, get on committees in your organization. If you're just trying to meet the people in your organization, you know, if you don't know anything about it, you know. Yeah. In a meeting, you don't have to voice every opinion you have in a meeting. But at the end of the meeting, do not be afraid to offer your hand. Right? Walk up to somebody and say, "Hi, I'm." Hi, I'm, and go and meet the people in the room. Because the next time you, you're in a meeting, they're going to go, oh, I know them. I know them, I know them, I know them. And it's going to build from there. Then it'll build into a conversation. Then it will build into a relationship. Then it will build into the, the first step every single time. has worked for me since from the very beginning. Just walk up, offer your hand, and say hello, and introduce yourself. Um, I've never, ever had somebody say, yeah, 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 I don't have time. Never once. Uh, and that's a good way to start relationships. That's true. Make it sh make your make it a point just to meet as many people as you can in your organization. So. Christy. Yeah, I just, I just want to echo that. It's, it's it's so much about relationship management. I mean, that's what it is. I think if you can get you know the executive team and those you're working with to to know you, to trust you. And, if, and really, if, if they like you, that goes a long way. Because all that other stuff, if you can prove that you're a, a leader and you care about their program or their organization, be it you know, from a change management perspective or from a project manager, um, that's going to go um, a tremendous way. And then the other thing is, and those of us, I'm not sure who's IT and who's from the program in here, but um, you have to be careful and not talk over their head. Because sometimes, you know, we can use acronyms and, you know, we only have half an hour as a busy executive, so we're trying to get everything in there. And so you have to, I think that's a tip for change management or anything in, this, in the project management arena, but you have to be um, aware of that as well. 
That's a really good point. We had a little bit of discussion about that this morning. And the other thing is is putting it in terms of, of the impact to them and, and what they understand and, and related to their business. And it's, yeah, it's tech speak. They don't care. Just tell me why it's not working. What are you going to do to fix it? And how are we going to move forward? And you understand why it's a priority for me to get this done kind of thing, right? So okay. any questions? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, speaking of, you know, on the on the program side, um, just just kind of again bringing it down to the individual level here, where and Bill is very aware of this whole project. We're we're in the process. We turned his project inside out, I think, because we took we had a, a need business need that took a project that he was planning on doing at the tail end of his replacement and we're putting it in the beginning of his replacement. Um, looking at trying to deal with the business processes and the things that we need to do, change management on the business side as well as on the IT side. What, how should we approach making sure that our IT members of the team are clear or have the have the material that they need to be able to to make the software changes or do the other things that are necessary um, in a in a way you know trying to you've got a very short period of time to get this in it's not a multi-year it's a you know we need to get this now mm -hmm. um, moving things forward what's your experience about the information that you get from the business side that allows it, that makes it easier for you to do your job. I'll start, but I'm sure everybody has an example of this. Uh, you know, legislative changes come in every year, so we're always caught off with this, this how do we do it, how do we do it? You know, and so it's a very quick uh, group up, I think, with your sponsor as well as with your team to understand that the change is happening and we've got to address the change and we're gonna have to come up with an approach that's gonna be effective for us to address the change. And there's always a lot of what has to be done versus what can wait kind of analysis, right? You know, so sometimes some things can wait and maybe it's not a full automation day one, but you can, you can live with what you're going to be able, but then there needs to be an understanding of that workaround process that might happen. Now on the IT side, you know, it's hard sometimes when teams don't like change, you know, and, and it's, they've got to understand it's necessitated by a business need and they've got to get, and we've talked about that earlier this morning, right? Getting on board the whole team needs to be understanding what we're trying to accomplish with the project so that they can understand why a change might have to be something reprioritized. So the information that you were saying from your side, yeah. from the IT side, saying make sure your business people understand mm -hmm. what, what's in it for them, then it's yeah. also from the business side saying to the other side, here's, here's why we really need to have Right, and Nirvana is when you have a business side that really knows what they're doing and really gets this, right? So that's that's kind of the best project I've ever been on is where that happened, and that doesn't happen very often. But, you know, that's where it's really good because they know and they understand and they understand what you're trying to accomplish, right? You know, but there's various shades of that, and so sometimes you have to really educate them about what you're doing and why a change is going to take time, um, you know. So that's it's a challenge, but that's the art. That's the art, and that's just what you gain by experience, right? You're not going to maybe do it well the first project you run, but you get better at it as you go along. And that's kind of what I was trying to impart about, just learning. <laughs> um, in my experience, one of the best things the business can do to help IT is to explain to me how do you do your business. You know, um, one of the things that I've noticed is sometimes the, we do, as IT, we don't do a great job of asking the right questions. And so you don't know what it is we're looking for. And um, and so as a result, I think sometimes the business tries to put themselves in the IT shoes and talk IT speak to us because we're not getting what you're telling us. And um, and that doesn't necessarily help. So it, it's better if the business would tell me, the program side will tell me, this is how I do the work. I have a legislation coming in. This is how it's going to change my business processes. This is how I'm going to change the way um, I work with my staff. My call centers are going to be modified like this. This is how my life will change. Then I can take that and I can go and ask questions that help define now what on the IT system side is that going to impact. And then together we can determine how do I change those systems and what do I affect. 
from my point of view, one of the first things you can do as a business is start using the word we. Not you, not us, we. When a business owner comes in, stands next to me and says, we are going to do this thing and I'm gonna put this much skin in the game and you're gonna put this much skin in the game and we're gonna get this solution. So that I immediately know as a program director that I have somebody who's gonna be a partner with me and I'm not gonna have to fight constantly through business. Also, engage the resources. Don't say we need this thing, change your schedule, move it to the front of your schedule and then, but yeah, we'll be there in a couple meetings this time and a couple, oh, but we've got this other thing that we gotta meet on and this is more important. If you're asking somebody else to change their priority, you've gotta change your priority. You've gotta show that you have as much commitment to what you need to get done as you're asking of them. You know, the communication being the two-way street. And once people see that you have a skin in the game and that you're standing in partnership with the, with the project director or the, pro the program director, what'll happen is the staff will start to see the same thing. They'll start to engage. You'll start to get that sense of urgency that, that you're trying to get, both from the IT side and from the business side. Um, frankly, what we do is we usually ask people to come and live with us. We have space, you know, we have space, they come and they live in a bullpen with us for like four or five days in which we do requirements. But the thing is, is it creates a dynamic with the team right away. They start seeing themselves as us, not you, them, no one, so it's us. And so later on when we have to have a follow-on meeting or something like that, it's making a call to somebody they've worked with very closely, okay? And that's how you can get something done very, very quickly uh, and convey from a top-down standpoint to your staff to get what you want. So, uh, all excellent comments. I, and I think the thing I would add is, you know, at the Chemist Division, we have been taking on projects over the n last number of years, and we haven't had a good intake process, right? And, you know, it's sort of everything's the number one priority, and we'll have to get to all of it eventually. Well, with the specter of system replacement, it forces us to prioritize our projects. And it really has been the impetus for going to more of a portfolio management approach. And so as we had a discussion about the provider enrollment project and is this a priority, it went up to our director and our director confirmed for us this is a near-term priority. And so we put it into our portfolio uh, for 2014, 13 and 14. Um, it did mean that other projects aren't aren't going to get done in 2014 and we had a conversation with the director that because this is a priority give unless we have additional resources this other project is going to push out um, in, into later into the system uh, replacement time frame but you know as we have that conversation with the various program areas it has to be about relative priority and we have a governance structure and approach where we meet every two weeks with the director of the department and we have a conversation about you know are do these remain the same priorities we see some con conflicts and priorities how do we want to manage it we always come with a recommendation and and um, you know we saw the business value so on the IT side that was helpful to us and we learned you know not only what it would take to um, implement the system change but it comes with a whole bunch of business process redesign workflow design and that really is a set of activities that is going to be led by our program areas so it's coming to the project understanding what we're going to do what our vendor is going to do but also the the level of effort the program folks are going to take on and I agree with with all the calls in particular that we we have to talk about the project as our project not that it's an IT project or that it's your project but it is our project and we will succeed together and if we don't work well together we will fail together excellent any more questions all right, so Sumi's gonna talk about how are you gonna face the uh, old culture in the new world. Okay, so I want to talk to you about culture, and uh, culture is a very important aspect of what we do um, as project managers, as change agents, and um, we need to take it very seriously. Um, I'm with EDD right now, but I've only been with the state for about four years, and before I came to work for the state, um, I was in private industry, and so I had an opportunity to see a lot of different cultures, and uh, so I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the, the 
project cultures that I've I've been involved in. I was um, at one project, and this was back in the you know the dot com days, and this was a startup, and um, and they had a very young culture. You know, I mean, I think the average age was like 26, and you know they had uh, catered lunches and catered dinners, and they had candy in the you know lunch cafeteria that you could just grab. Everybody was roaming around like crazy. They would not sit still to have a meeting. You couldn't have a meeting with these people. And you could you could send them emails, and everybody had their little laptops out, but but you couldn't sit them down. It just wasn't their culture. So we had to change our approach. Then I was in a company that was um, a very technical, very engineering company. And in this company, I was trying to implement agile development and agile project management, which as we heard at the lunch session, is very much about breaking silos and breaking barriers. Well, this culture in this company was everybody sat in their little offices and, and the building in particular had an office with a door for each and every person. Not for every manager, each and every person, every developer, every analyst analyst, everybody had an office with a door that they could close. How am I supposed to break barriers when you can go lock yourself up in your office? I can't, I can't even walk by your cubicle and go, hi, you know? So that was, that was something I had to work around. So then that same thing, couldn't pull them together. I had to go to every person's office on a regular basis, knock on their door, go inside, right? And so, so you have to be very much aware of the culture that you're um, implementing or managing your project in. Um, when I came to the state, I've been very fortunate to be at EDD and um, to um, implement uh, many of the um, modernization projects that EDD's had going for the last few years. And one of the things I recognized right off the bat is that we've got a tremendous amount of engaged staff. You know, we talked this morning about engaging our staff. We don't have that problem at EDD. We are so engaged. Everybody wants to be involved. And so we had numerous projects going on. I think at one time I had 14 projects in the portfolio. So everybody was working on something and everything interacted with each other. And um, and what I missed, because I was used to creating a project team, you know, creating a group of technical team and, and them working in the organization, maybe building a design. What I missed was at EDD, every Everybody's on every team. So you've got to pull everybody together. And we were building um, many different systems, but there was always somebody in the organization that I had no idea was actually a contributor to the technical team and who had an opinion and who had an approach to the design. Once I finally figured that out, we had these huge meetings. We went through the design, we let them um, talk, we let them provide their approach. Oftentimes, the approach would go around and around and around through all of the things that the technical, the project team had already covered, but we let them talk and we let them provide input. And everybody from all over the organization came to provide input. We ended up exactly where we were when we started, and it may have taken us, you know, two or three weeks to get there, but everybody felt like they had buy-in. So now I had a system that everybody was getting behind and could implement. But that was something I had to learn because that was a different culture from all of the other cultures. So from a cultural perspective, you have to be really aware where, what am I working in? What is the environment that I'm in? And um, the other thing I want to say about culture is, as a change agent, we have to be careful that we're not walking into a culture and expecting them to change the way that we want them to work. Um, respect the old culture. Be aware of it and, and give it some respect. There are, there's never anything that's 100% good or 100% bad. So the old culture had um, a need, it served a purpose, and it performed its act, what it needed to perform well, because it worked for such a long time. So understand what they did, why they did it, and take the good parts of it and apply them to the new culture, and then bring in the change where you see the gaps or where you see you can support or where um, the modernization is changing. So any questions? Okay. Awesome. All right. 
Well, um, before we move on to the next uh, phase of the program today, uh, anybody have any sort of wrap-up questions in terms of anything that they've presented to this point? No? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I, I would just love to hear your, your thoughts on what you've heard. I mean, I, I know you have them. And I, but, and I also know we're like right on time, but uh -huh. I'm, I'm just curious if you wouldn't mind just sharing. Because I, these are just pearls of wisdom that are just phenomenal. I think we've experienced similar things, and I think people in the audience have too. Yeah. So if you were to wrap it. I guess it, the only thing I would wrap into this is um, change management is not a project. Change management is part of the project. It is not a separate engagement. It is not this stepchild that sits and rides along in parallel to everything else you're doing, right? It is interwoven. It, it's electricity, right? You flip this project switch on, change management is in the wall, right? It's an inherent part of what you do. And so in order to get to that point, to get to that element where you're not projectizing change management because once it becomes a project now it is a competing element to the core project okay it's not congruent to it it doesn't have it's it's this it's its own thing right and so by the definition of a project you now have to manage it through governance you have to manage it through resource management you have to manage it as a separate element Right? Now you can contract for it under a separate contract. Doesn't have to be part of the, you know, part of the maybe if you have a prime vendor who's doing work or whatever it may be. That's a different that's a contracting issue. That's just a that's the mechanics of how do you get resource to do it. But the project itself integrates project management into every step. So your business analysts have to practice it, your project managers have to practice it. Your executives have to be on board with it from pre-initiation and understanding that, you know, the biggest thing that we always hear on, on the vendor side, right, is I want to modernize my system, but I don't want any of the processes to change, right? I just want new technology so that it's easier. I don't have to do it in assembly or COBOL, or I want to get rid of my database natural, or I want to get rid of my vSAM or IDMS, and I want to, I want to move into a better environment where I can go and just hire Java or, or C Sharp developers, and it's just so much easier to get the, but I don't want to change anything else, right? Well, that is a change management element because the nature of hiring you know, one of the vendors that you guys have hired to come in and do the systems that you've done and the history of what you've done, they bring in, you know, solution sets that have automated chunks of the process. So now people's jobs have changed from day one. So if you're going to try to deal with that on the fly, right, now you're trying to do damage control. You're not doing change management or transformation management. You're doing damage control because you have people who are tenured staff who are saying, look, I'm a COBOL developer. I'm a, you know, I'm a, a, a database administrator, right? I, I got three, four, five years left. I'm not going to go learn a new technology. I'm not going to, what are you talking, you know, and, and moreover, I am a domain expert in this area, right? And now I have to go and learn how to be some thing. I, they can't put their heads around that, right? Are they, let, let me, let me, they don't want to put their heads around that. So all I would advocate is that when you think about change management, don't think of it as this satellite effort. It is, it is integrated into every requirements meeting, every change management meeting, every governance meeting, every stakeholder meeting, every external, internal communication. It is the nature by which you conduct the project. It is the culture of the project, right? Rather than being something that works as a, oh yeah, um, I have people, uh, I gotta do something with them. All right. I mean, it, it really, because that's the, that's when you start to have the collisions. I, I would I would offer, right? So that that's my two cents around that. So yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 
have a question. Uh, in the situation that you were talking about, a COBOL developer or a DBA having only a few more years. Yes. And uh, adaptation of change is difficult over there. Yes. So how would you approach a few in that situation? Well, the, the thing that is important is that you know, I've always believed in the practice that you never tell somebody something, okay? You come and you ask for their input, right? So rather than telling you your job is going to change, we're going to do a modernization. How do you see that affecting or rolling out or what would be your input around that modernization, how things would work, right? And that to me, and I've shared this a little bit this morning, is that to me begins to create and congeal a little bit of that. Uh, I'm part, I'm an owner, and that's been shared by these folks. I'm an owner in this decision. I'm not just a person that's being done to, right? And that goes for both technical individuals, but also business people, right? Because if you have folks that are uh, in the field, working at a field office, and a lot of the steps that they do is now being automated or changed, or their interaction is being changed, right? They're heavily affected. And so you begin with that. Now, you're inherently going to have flat-out, bold-faced resistance to that. It's just the nature of it. So the plan begins to shape in terms of the change management, because, you know, this is a topic that we could really go down a rabbit hole on, right? But it, the, the, the the plan begins to take shape of, do you begin to treat them as this contained SME group who can now help with the business rules extraction process and the data conversion process, right? And what you do in that is now you're capturing their institutional knowledge, right? Which is the largest threat you have in your technical teams and, and, and program teams. That when that walks out the door, especially after, you know, not this administration, last administration, I don't want to get too much into that, but, you know, there's a lot of pent up, you know, I'm walking and I'm taking it all with me, right? And understandably, some people feel that way. That you start to capture that in the business rules extraction process, and now you're documenting what's in their melon, right? You've got the You've got the content going. And they become these subject matter advisors to the team. You can begin to position them into that, create a transition process to bring in new resources that'll support this new system that you're doing. You don't alienate them. You give them a path for their participation. And maybe they don't, they're not this COBOL development unit anymore. Maybe they're the subject matter development unit in some capacity, and you find a way to transition them, right? Because at the end of the day, people have to make a choice. It's, you know, the system is gonna change. How is your role gonna be in it? Asking what their role, I think, is a vital piece to include them in that process. But secondarily, how do we, how do we not alienate this subject matter knowledge, capture it, have them be part of the testing process, have them be part of that business rules extraction process, have them be part of the, the overall validation component, technically, and then that, you know, that's an example of a path. It's not the path, but just to answer your question. Yeah, it, I think, yeah. Any, any other questions? Anything? Okay, no? so is it time to get, find out what these guys think? Mm -hmm. I think so. Into that scenario? I think so. They should. If you don't have a card, I think Ralph has extra over there, so. Do you do? Everybody have a card? Yeah. Do you need one here? Hey, so the trick is to find all the other people that match your card. <laughs> and that's your, that's your team. And so you can just pick a table with all the other penguins <laughs> or all the other race drivers. <laughs> yeah. I think so. I think we're good. Everybody comfortable with the number of people in your team? You feel like you could do some good work here? Create some chaos? Here we Create go. Here we go, right? So uh, the next step is going to be, you've got 20 minutes, all right? And you need to nominate somebody in the group who's going to take some, uh, some notes for your group. So there's... Uh, yeah, there's the um, big flip charts and markers around the room. You're welcome yep. to use those. And there's a little you... ledge there. You can prop them up, yep. okay? Somebody takes notes. And then somebody's your spokesperson, right? 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through this scenario and a question, and we're going to ask you as a team to come up with the answer to the question, right? And then you're going to have one, in, you're going to nominate one very fortunate individual from your team to present your perspective on how this is, is, is addressed. And the value proposition here is then you get these guys wandering around to help you out and provide input and answer questions in terms of what you're thinking, in terms of the approach. And then as you guys begin to present, they'll provide that feedback, right? Because I think one of the super valid things that can happen here is that when you step out of a scenario like this, where you're in a class or some kind of a session and people are just kind of talking at you the whole time, it's, you know, you're like, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. But then you go to try to put it into practice somewhere and you're like, oh, I'm really not clear how to do it. And you either may shy away from it or you may do something else with it, right? So here's a time where taking some of the inputs that you've had from this panel and start to apply it within some thinking process. And we can provide that feedback and say, hey, that was some good stuff and also bring this into the fold, okay? So go nuts. You know, just really go after it and uh, have fun with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the scenario and the question and then start the timer and get you guys going. Everybody, are we good? Right? Wow. Enthusiasm. Post-launch enthusiasm. <laughs> right. This is also a part of the, you don't fall asleep. So, um, so in transitioning from a decentralized program by, run by 58 local uh, county agencies to a single statewide system, there were a number of undocumented business processes that were represented, uh, that represented unplanned and unresourced work. This was financial management and system administration work previously performed by the local county agencies that the state would be assuming with administration of the new centralized system. Okay, so the question what strategies, including business process redesign, were needed to support the identification and documentation of new business processes, resource, and skill set needed uh, needs? Describe the OCM strategies you would employ to make the implementation of new state business functions and organizational units a success. All right. So the scenario gives you context of what you're dealing with. And the question is, how would you apply the OCM within this context of this condition? Everybody comfortable? Yes, sir. We're doing it for the state side, not for the county. That are We're doing it for the state side. Great question. Any more questions? Anybody hate this question? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Any, just anything? Change it to institutions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So we'll go 20 minutes. These folks will be wandering. I'll be wandering around. You can ask questions and have at it. And then uh, we'll, we'll regroup. OK? All right, guys. Let's get our thoughts together and nominate your uh, speaker, representer, your thought leader of the group. Good to go? All right, so if I could have, just, just so we know, who is the if, the, if the, if the speaker from your group can just stand up so we know who's the, who do we pick on? All right, good. Brave people. Two, awesome. That's great. Who's going to be the speaker here for your group? Oh, you just happen to be standing? That's how you got elected? You're the speaker? Okay. Okay. Who's who's the speaker from this from this table? Blair, you're going to talk for your table. You're going to take it. Okay. All right. So here we go. So just to add in, um, the whole reason we did this is because all these stakeholders up here, all these uh, sort of executives, have open rec positions in their organization. They're just trying to pilfer and trying to find it. Okay, where are we going to start? <laughs> oh, oh. Why don't we start here so he doesn't get killed by his board? All right. Oh, 
Okay. Here, I'll. I'll no, I'll, I'll hold. I'll hold it up, okay, and I'll trade. How's that? All right. I'll be your flip chart. Ah, oh, thank you. Or whatever. Okay, so I'm sure everybody loved this question as much as we did. Um, I have a project management background, so I think our group, they all seem that way. We had a pretty good handle, I think, on the, the normal processes. David, can you say who you, who you are? Oh, you sorry. Um, my name is David Remp. Um, I've got uh, 17 years with the Employment Development Department, and um, I was involved as the assistant project manager for the state uh, disability insurance online system that went live last year. I left state service um, to private industry for about three years in Sydney, Australia, uh, to work private industry, came back to the states, and it took three years for the RFP to go through the process and for a vendor to get signed. So I, it was like a hiatus for three years. <laughs> and I came right back into um, design development um, deployment. Awesome. So that was interesting, but um, anyway, um, I think we all had some good project management background based on the feedback that we all put together. Uh, kind of a unique situation though, um, coming with so many offices and then centralizing a process like that. Uh, the difficulty is getting all those people engaged. So we went through the normal um, assessment of, okay, you need a gap analysis. The process in the field in these 58 offices and then centralizing all this. Um, you need to get the stakeholders involved, uh, which would involve all those folks in all those offices, and the, the communication plan to, to get all that together and have them all come to the same table where you get the steering committee done, you get the charter finished, um, you get your sponsor who is going to change soon, <laughs> um, and all your plans around that that you have. And um, I think the big thing is the engagement um, of all of these folks and how do you handle that, making sure that they're involved. So you do your gap analysis, your as is, your to be, and then you look at your resources. Um, had some good feedback from a lot of the folks on the panel here. And they're like, hey, you got 58 offices. You know, maybe there's some resource there. Um, and also we've lost that SME, that so valuable SME that nothing can function without them. <laughs> well, maybe not. Again, there's 58 offices. Um, get that feedback, the steering committee. Who else has this knowledge? And if there is nobody else that has this knowledge, well, uh, like they said earlier in the meeting, don't just look down and figure it out. Look up. The answer may be there. I go, go to the person. Ask them, you know, congratulations on your new <laughs> vendor job. Are you working for the vendor who's going to be working on the project? <laughs> um, you know, what do you have? Who are your contacts? Um, what are you willing to do? Can you do a quick, can we have you for 30 days, do a knowledge transfer? see what you have, look at the high level components to get that information and then let the teams process it the best we can to, to fit that in. Um, so to get through that, um, once you get your plan together, you've got all your processes, you're ready to go, sponsor's gone. So uh, Sumi provided some good input. Um, um, she works at our department, so <laughs> I had a little advantage there <laughs> understanding what she's been through. Um, so I asked her about that, and her advice was um, very good in the sense that, you know, don't get caught up on the processes. Uh, they may ne not necessarily want to ch share those with you because they might be out of a job. Um, so make sure that you understand the customer's needs. Uh, what are those 58 offices? What did they need from what is now being centralized, and how are you going to meet that? and make sure that the sponsor understands in the steer steering committee with all the stakeholders um, what those needs are, the fact that they all agree and support uh, where you're going with the project and how it's going to be executed so that they have buy-in from the beginning and have confidence that their customer is being supported and they can stand behind uh, what's moving forward. And if not, they at least have a clear view of, of how to provide input and advice um, to the team. And then, of course, you know, building in on something like this, the risk management um, is huge. I attended that session this morning, uh, as did a couple other folks on the team. When there's so many unknowns in a project like this, you have to really have uh, an ongoing uh, tight uh, risk management um, process over it so that you can catch the things that are going to be missed that come up that you need to mitigate. And if you have a, can get a plan for it ahead of time, of course, that's the best. But um, and just move from there and keep everyone uh, 
engaged and communicated. I think the main theme I got out of the whole panel here was regardless of uh, what the subject matter of the issue was or the unique scenario, it was all about communication and uh, what type of communication you needed for the individual or individuals you're working with. So I think that was the biggest thing I pulled out of it, but nice. yeah. Okay. That's it? Yeah. Good. Nice. Well done. Thanks. All right. Now, panelists, any feedback? Any quick thoughts? Are you serious? He knocked it out of the park that, oh, wow. It was a double. <laughs> All right. Just one thing with any group of stakeholders, but I, having been through this with counties before too, is it is very hard to get 58 different counties to think of one vision of one system, you know, even if you say you're gonna do it, you know. Um, and so that business process and trying to do the gap, you know, at, at some point there may be the need just to say, we're trying to come up with the best solution, but, but we're going to make decisions that not everybody will agree with, but we're going to move it forward, right? You know, and, and if it's mandated, it's a little easier than when it has to be kind of, we ask you to participate, you know, but um, it's, it's a challenge. It is a real challenge. I mean, those are the right steps, but it's, it's real hard to get everybody to get in lockstep on moving that. And, and counties have, you know, in our systems, there's 60,000 welfare workers. So who is the representation of that business process for them that you need to have engaged to help make decisions on the project and bringing up county staff is the model we've been using too like you have this county we call them county consultants but county SMEs and they're on the project full time but even then you don't always have that communication of the decision making and everybody agreeing so it's a, it's a real challenge so yeah the only thing that I was saying is that you know governance and decision making when you have 58 stakeholders you know what is your governance it has to be clearly established up front you know, how is it going to be voted on? How is it going to be decided? How are you going to memorialize it? And how are you going to hold everybody to it? Okay, that's just one of the number one things. So. Awesome. All right. Who's next? Who's next? Yes. <laughs> Courage under fire. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself. Is this on? All right. Um, I'm Susie McBride. I work for the Department of Child Support Services. I'm a section manager for our technology services division. And we actually went through a, uh, well, I joined the project at version two of implementation for a single statewide child support system for all 58 counties. We were mandated by the federal government and paying fines to not having that done by a certain time frame. So it was a big vendor, he failed twice. IBM came in and rescued, you know, the billion dollar system implementation to stop the fines from the federal government. So we had quite an extensive time and a ride, so I completely identify with the situation. But to, to your point about the 58 counties and the decision-making process, we actually had the top six, and we called it the big six meeting, where we would get with them and say, okay, here's the federal requirement, and as part of this, you know, we have to make a decision what we're gonna implement statewide along with this government. So we had kind of who screamed the loudest, really, kind of discussions, and who represented the biggest part of our population. So um, w I actually wrote down the wrong acronym. So OCM strategies to address this. We had our first step as ID and consult uh, stakeholders and sponsors. Again, we are looking at it from a structured project management methodology, um, going through the initiating, the planning, the controlling, all those good PMI steps. Um, planning communications, establishing a charter in this situation, uh, making sure we had a governance team. So um, I think we were just talking about that a second ago. Documenting the as is and to be, again, making sure it, once we get to a certain step, uh, you know, if we can't agree upon that, having an escalation, a risk management process to make sure we can implement that. And then as a result, get gaps, resolutions, and of course, it sounds like we have an unresourced need here. So we will acquire resources, get budget, get fundings, all those good things. And um, so yeah, and then as part of that, we'd have a new operational model that we'd have to establish. Um, ongoing, we had some controlling communications that we would need to do, so sponsor statuses, you know, recurring as we went through this um, new implementation. We'd have to support the ongoing needs. 
And then as far as our gotchas after the SME leaves, we had identify additional SMEs and committees. So if we had one person who had all this knowledge, we'd need to get a committee of people, right, <laughs> to get all that knowledge back together. So we'd try to go steal and make decisions based on that, do some knowledge transfer, and if we need to, get people trained. When we had a new executive sponsor, we'd meet with that sponsor, set some expectations, and that would go both ways, I would assume, not just us. Um, <laughs> share, explain benefits, um, impacts and risks, document anything they want to change, they need to change. Obviously, they're footing the bill now if they're the new sponsor. Um, understand how to meet their needs, and then generate the buy-in and the trust, like we talked about earlier. Nice work. Yay. Thank you for stepping up. All right. Who's next? I like this table. <laughs> All right, Judith, tell us a little bit about yourself and run us through oh. the gamut. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm Judy Phelps, and I'm with the Department of Healthcare Services, and, <laughs> and I'm on the business side. <laughs> I am not a PM at all. So, <laughs> so we're kind of working through this from the other side from the other side so I probably won't have all the steps right in, uh, in great, spots though. okay but um, one of the things that the first thing that we wanted to do was to um, engage the counties try to get them to, to, to give us their SMEs and try to, to select them so that we could do the do find out what the as is so we could come up with that and figure out we are we're assuming that in the process in as an economist I assume a lot it's, just, <laughs> it's um they but in working through some of this stuff so that we could get the as is and be able to 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 determine what it was that we were building at the state level um, assuming this is an undocumented if this is an undocumented workload we need to know what that workload is before we can make any further decisions we also thought that we would use a, rather than trying to engage all 58 counties that we would use a cross-section allow you know allow the counties to select those SMEs that would represent them so we would have folks from the larger counties some from the middle-sized counties you know go through there the rural counties make sure we don't forget them in this process because everyone runs it a different way so we find out what everybody's pretty much got in a cross section and take that as our ability to use that to build the you know to fill in the gaps then um, the county executive who was deciding to bail in the in the middle of this with all with all the knowledge we um, we also decided that we, you know as soon as we got that information that we would meet with that county executive and again very similar to over here see if we can if we can either get that information very quickly or perhaps do a short-term contract or something like that to be able to get that information through there um, again with the with the new sponsor um, to meet with them communicate and thanks Paul for the suggestion that we um, that rather than trying to do that all ourselves that we engage the counties again to develop and, and become program champions for this to convince the sponsor that they ought to be part of that of that process um, and then again using the, the cross section of the counties to you know to have the shared vision of how the the project should go together that we would be able to deliver that um, identify where the resources could be coming from and um, develop our whole communication plan so that everything would go out to the counties and deal with them the way that they could that, that they could accept Good. nice work well done Okay, so we're like running on fumes here on uh, time. So what I'd like to do, not to take away from the work that you have done, is we've already heard a lot of, of good concepts coming from half the group. So if what I'll do is I'll hand it over to you guys, and if you can kind of bring up points that maybe you thought of that were sort of a delta away from what everybody else had, and kind of go through that. All right. I'm Yasar Dabur. I'm uh, with the Treasurer uh, Office, uh, working with the change management uh, team for, uh, on the fiscal project. Um, 
So pretty much actually we are in line with everything you mentioned. I could highlight just a few things that we thought of. Um, we thought of actually conducting a peer review, look for a state where they had similar project that was conducted in the past, so as not to reinvent the wheel, uh, learn uh, uh, what processes they used, uh, what methodology, what problems they've, uh, they faced, um, and uh, how they mitigated these issues, lessons learned, and the like. Um, also, um, uh, the communication, uh, we have actually, uh, w we wanted to plan a communication plan and uh, we wanted to emphasize that it's a two-way plan. It's uh, disseminating information and collecting information also from the counties. Because it is uh, um, the, the one of the issues that uh, there were many uh, a number of undocumented business processes, I was thinking in line of uh, uh, joint application development probably to ha uh, to have a network of champions in the counties where each could bring uh, 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 their ideas about how to standardize the process, uh, what values they have to bring into the table, and have pro sort of a brainstorming session to collect. Uh, these ideas. Um, anything um, else I'm missing here? Um, we talked about uh, Adcar's uh, idea for as a methodology for change, and um, that's about it. Pretty much um, everything else I think you guys captured. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Anything? Where's the delta of things that you guys thought that haven't been presented yet? I think about the only thing that we might have is create and provide training and job aids, but uh, it specifically around um, identifying those things. You saw I took the last one, which was really around the desire and identify the incentives for moving into the new system and, and communicating those incentives. So, uh, actually, actually, they have one that's I think is really important to create the dog and pony shows. Yeah, I like that. Uh, literally, the road shows that go around from county to county. You build support with those things. Yeah. You, you literally yes. they work. Medicine shows work. But I heard those over there. Well, did I hear medicine shows? <laughs> one, or one, 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 shows? one thing is a challenge no, for me no, I think, yeah. that I really like input is the concept of getting people to feel ownership, yeah. to be participant. Mm -hmm. This is a state. Yeah. And we cannot just give people up, up bonuses and promises. So it's, you know, bureaucratically mm -hmm. is impossible. How do you go about not everybody has internal motivation, mm -hmm. and burning desire for excelling. There are lots of people, especially the father from the project. Right. Right? How do you get these people, what's the best mechanism to get these people to feel a sense of ownership mm -hmm. and the participation? Because if they feel a sense of ownership, their own engine right. picks the stuff, right. and then we have a lot easier job to move in this thing. Right. Because they use their own energy to move forward. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest challenge, I think, Okay. Okay. Do you guys want to feel it? You want me to feel it? Um, like we're talking about, we have 60,000 welfare workers. We're not going to get to the 60,000th and have them buy into a system replacement, right? But yeah, the, the key is having that team of leadership that is engaged in the project that you're counting on them to communicate some of that down through their organizations, right? And regular meetings with the county leadership, we do that. And a lot of these counties have uh, associations that they work through, so the child support directors, welfare directors. So we work with them very closely also to get the engagement and buy-in. And it's also, you know, the consequences of not kind of going from the leadership. A lot of, in most of our projects, we have hundreds of millions of federal dollars at stake and fines and penalties if we don't do things right. So, and it may be the case or not in your department, but it's still, uh, you know, it's doing the best, what's in the best interest for the state of California moving forward. But getting some kind of leadership team that can engage at the, at the level at the state with the state to communicate down through the counties awesome. that has the power to do that. Cool. <clears throat> and if you're speaking about, uh, you know, retention of staff, especially like we're losing the SME because they're going on to take a, you know, private sector role or something. The biggest things you, you can do for retention of staff is things is create the team dynamic. You know, project teams can be very close knit and people are more than willing to, um, <laughs> that's mine. Pardon, pardon. <laughs> I'm, I'm, inter I'm interrupting myself. <laughs> Don't uh, you hate that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I know, I hate that. So anyway, um, it, it, so what you do is you, you create that team dynamic because you'll find that most people are willing to commit to the person next to them. 
They're willing to commit to the people in the trenches with them. So you, you, as long as you can, if you have a shared vision, like we were talking about earlier, if you have a shared goal that we're trying to achieve something bigger, a higher goal than, than just you know day-to-day -day work, and, and then again, it also comes down to, you know, when you're doing your uh, succession planning, bring people in that take it seriously. Don't just fill a position because, you know, you got to fill a position. Um, and that's how, you, that's how you get retention, and that's how you get a high morale, and that's how you get people to stay. And then, the, yeah, the only other thing I would add to that is that, you know, is people want to have a voice. Everybody want, I don't care who you are, you want to have a voice in your future. And as long as there's some construct that they maybe locally roll up their thoughts to one group or one individual who then represents their voice, just like, just like government, right? Um, your, your representative, your congressman, right? As long as they have a voice in that, that brings some, some of that stake manage, stakeholder management to them. Okay? All right, guys. What's your delta on what everybody else has? I think we just take all the posters and uh, stick it up here. That's our strategy. But um, along the lines of everyone spoke, but uh, the only one thing I wanted to highlight was a uh, couple of things. Uh, JAD sessions or uh, have the SME leaving. Uh, SME helped us here with is, uh, document some business processes that might help us transition uh, the, uh, and the help with the centralized processes. At the same time, have all the 58 counties uh, regular meetings with them, kind of town hall meetings, and get their buy-in. And uh, once you have the centralized process in place, some counties have to make some sacrifices. And uh, that's it, they have to bite the bullet and go with the change and uh, implement the centralized process. So that's where. Nice, good work. Thank you. All right, so I think I think we've got a raffle that we're going to do really quick. We're going to let you guys get out of here. I'm sorry we've kept you a little bit late, but you know, feedback I think from us, I'll take the leap and speak for everybody up here, is that you guys have just been fantastic. Um, thank you for spending two hours with us. We really appreciate your thoughts and inputs. And um, so yeah, so we'll do the raffle and then we can break out and go from there. And all the CDs, little cubes on the table, bracelets, take an extra pocket full of chocolate, those are for you. The CDs do include uh, the presentation from today, plus some, um, some cool little uh, resources and tools uh, that were supplied by uh, um, people on the advisory board. So right, please and take those. And if there's extras and you want to take one back to your team. Just so you know, the presentation that's on those um, C CDs are the entire full day. So if you weren't here in the morning, you also have those slides. <laughs> Well, thanks, guys. On behalf of everybody here, thank you for your time. Thank you for your engagement. I think this was wonderful. I don't know, Bill, do you want to tell them where the scenario came from? The scenario came from the California Child Support Automation System. If it didn't sound familiar. So way to go, guys. Nice job. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone.